So welcome to this webinar um, on COCO Producer Agency and the Living Income Differential, um, Lessons from Civil Society Organisations. My name is uh, Matt Wright. I'm going to be providing the technical support um, today. I'm going to hand over to my colleagues um, and hope you have a great webinar. Thank you very much. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Polak and I'm a researcher at the International Institute for Environment and Development. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the seventh webinar in the series we've been running on approaches to empowering producers uh, in commercial agriculture. It's fantastic to see so many people could join us today uh, from all over the world and wonderful for the first time in this series, we've been able to welcome French speakers to the webinar. So welcome to everyone, whether joining for the first time or if you're returning after previous ones in the series. Um, for those who can't be here and for the information of all attending today, as Matt said, we'll be recording um, and we'll also put out a blog item on the discussion um, following the event for others to, to catch up. Um, this webinar series on empowering producers in commercial agriculture is supported by a four year project led by IAED in collaboration with partners in Nepal and Malawi, uh, and it's funded by the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. Um, so a key part of this endeavour that we've been working on is gathering evidence from around the world on just how small scale farmers are exercising agency um, to address challenges and strengthen their position in their trading relations. And this, of course, happens in a myriad of ways. Um, in this work, we define agency as the ability to make choices and affect change according to one's own priorities, and that can be individually or collectively. Um, and this is in response to a context where small scale farmers are persistently facing information and power asymmetries. But there are certain approaches and forms of legal empowerment that can challenge these, and, and particularly if an agency approach is taken, and that's really what we're exploring. And that means approaches that enable farmers to be in the driving seat, or at least be engaging and interacting with public and private sector actors from a position of, of strength. Undoubtedly, given the systemic and structural challenges that seeking a better price or negotiating a better deal uh, face, addressing agency is about addressing power and power relations. So previous webinars have explored strategies to overcome challenges associated with contract farming arrangements or for negotiating new contracts in the context of very adverse arrangements with large international buyers. Uh, also on what types of digital platforms or dialogues along the value chain might create a more even playing field, at least for negotiations um, and for setting up the trading arrangements. The previous webinar in the series looked at producer agency in the context of voluntary sustainability standards. Um, and this discussion, of course, touched on issues of minimum pricing and strategies that seek to promote a living income for farmers selling into global value chains. And so today's event builds on this a little. It explores the notion of producer agency in the context of West African cocoa, um, and more specifically in the context of the recent living income differential pricing mechanism, which was introduced through the Abidjan Declaration signed by the governments of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire in 2018. And the declaration aimed at better defending the interests of cocoa producers, as well as the economies of both countries. So it's intended to help producers earn a living income through a premium. It was first implemented in the cocoa growing season 2021 um, and is a bold new move by the governments to make to try and make a fundamental change to the structure of global markets to tackle poverty and ensure rural producers receive a living income. So today's event is going to explore the extent to which producers have been involved in the design of the LID, its implementation, monitoring, oversight, it will touch on how the LID is functioning in reality and what this tells us about the spaces for producer power and agency within the sector, uh, but also share key lessons that will go beyond living income debates in COCO alone. It will also touch on alternatives to the LID for improvement to livelihoods in COCO, in the COCO sector. So for, just for a bit of clarity, this event is not a broad debate about a living income in general terms, but about the LID in particular, and what we can learn from this experience about ways in which governments and their electorate might address fundamental power imbalances in supply chains. I'm delighted to say we have a fantastic panel of speakers with us today to share perspectives from civil society. 
um, to tackle this question of, of pharma agency. First up, we have Evelyn Bahn, the policy advisor on human rights and business for Incota in Germany. Evelyn has over 15 years experience on human rights issues in global supply chains, focusing on violations in the cocoa supply chain. Uh, following Evelyn, Pauline Dai um, will talk. Uh, Pauline is director of the Enardis Formation Côte d'Ivoire. Pauline holds a degree in agronomy, specializing in crop protection. And Enardis Formation is a network of pan-African associations that works for equitable and sustainable development in Africa. Then we'll have Sandra Kwabea Sakwa, who is a project officer at SEND Ghana and also coordinator of the Ghana Civil Society COCO platform. SEND specializes in policy research and advocacy, focusing on pro poor policy and development programs, monitoring in Ghana and service delivery through the promotion of livelihood security. And then we have Ismail Lepomasi, who is chairperson for the COCO Afrobopa Association in Ghana and member of the Ghana Civil Society COCO platform. And CAA is an independent organization for and by COCO farmers from Ghana, which seeks to create a better life for its members. So those are our four panelists um, and the speakers are gonna share their insights during the first 30 minutes. Um, and then we'll have um, under an hour, a little under an hour as uh, Matt introduced um, previously, please make use of the Q and A box as we go use the chat box for more general comments and sharing of information. Um, and then we'll pick up on those questions in the Q&A. So I'd first like to welcome Evelyn Barn and then Thierry, uh, my colleague, will take over with um, introducing the panelists. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Emily, and also to the whole team of IIED um, for the event, invitation to this event. Um, I and in quota highly welcome that IIED is giving some spotlight on the role of local civil society organizations in the discussion on the living income differential. And um, I think the most important part of today's event will be the input of Sandra, Pauline and Ismail, um, because they can give their position and the position of CSOs in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire and from Bruce producer organizations on what their lessons are from the living income differential um, discussion. Um, I would rather give some background what my observation is on how civil society is involved in political decision making processes in the cocoa sector. And um, I have been working in cocoa since about 10 years now, before I have worked on human rights issues in other um, global supply chains, like in textiles. And actually, I would say I don't know of any sector where there are more dialogue platforms than in Coco. There are platforms where only industry players get together, like the World Coco Foundation. Others are multi-stakeholder initiatives where industry players, governments, and civil society sit around the table like the German Initiative for Sustainable Cocoa. And they all aim to improve the livelihoods of cocoa farmers. Then there are countless conferences on cocoa topics, sometimes with a focus on living income, then again on deforestation, on child labor, all, all together. What I have observed when I started working on cocoa almost 10 years ago was that rarely representatives of the producers themselves were sitting at the negotiation table or local civil society organizations. Non-governmental organizations from Europe or the US and international NGOs were invited, but NGOs from the producing countries, local NGOs and their representatives um, where, and I would say, still are often underrepresented in the discussion. So in many of those conferences and roundtable discussions, we all talk about the cocoa farmers, but they themselves are not asked what to change to improve their lives or to protect their environment. The problems in the cocoa production are analyzed and actions are developed from industry players, from international NGOs or political stakeholders, but the real experts, the cocoa farmers and their representatives are often not involved. 
And Encota sees this as a crucial point to strengthening producer organizations and local civil society and the political dialogue. And what does that mean? What, what are their, their needs to be, become part of the political dialogue discussions? Um, we figured that, first of all, producer organizations and civil society need to have access to information on developments in the cocoa sector. Not just what is happening in their countries, because those information they have easier access to, but what is globally happening. To understand the issues, you need to understand the global supply chain. So you need the information from both sides of the supply chain. Um, but also producer organizations and local NGOs need the access to political decision-making processes. And um, many times we, we see that civil society in the producing countries are not even informed if new processes are started, for example, in the EU or in the US. And how can we address this? What is our approach to strengthen civil society organizations? Um, we believe that we need strong partnerships between NGOs in Europe and civil society in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire to work together. And um, we have strengthened those kind of partnerships, like some people who are here and working in COCO might know the voice network. Also, the voice network was for some years not really connected to local civil society organizations. But that has improved a lot and we have strengthened our positions together with our partners in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Um, a lot of exchange information is needed and um, yeah, basically on both sides of the supply chain, um, CSO communities need to work together. But then we also realized that besides the access to information, there's often a lack of logistical and financial possibilities to participate in decision making processes like in conferences and meetings. It starts already with the cost for travel expenses or the procurement of visas. Um, I would say there's a definitely a misbalance of power in the cocoa sector if it comes to financial and logistical resources of the different stakeholders and um, I think that is also a field for development interventions by public development agencies to support the advocacy work of CSOs in the producing countries. Um, I think that should also be in the interest of all stakeholders because the buy-in and decisions will highly depend on whether those affected, such as the cocoa farmers themselves, and support those decisions. And if they are not involved in the decision making process, um, that is weakening their buy in and the decision. And now I'm coming to the living income differential, which, which was initiated by the governments in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. And um, from all the discussions I had with CSOs in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, it's highly welcomed and it's seen as a very important process. But also their civil society was and is still insufficiently involved. And I think Sandra, Pauline and Ismail will have more to say about this. Um, from my side, I would like to make a call on all governments in Europe and in the producing countries, as well as representatives of the cocoa and chocolate industry to take into account the opinions and experience and especially also the innovative ideas of local producer organizations and local civil society in future debates for a sustainable cocoa sector. And I think that is the key um, to have really a sustainable cocoa sector in the future. So um, yeah, with this final call, I would like to pass on the input, um, I think, to Sandra. <laughs> Pauline, in fact. Um, ah, oh, to Pauline. <laughs> okay. Madame Zay, si vous êtes prête, je vous laisse parler. Merci. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Thank okay, you. merci. Merci. Uh, well, thank you. 
thank you to the IIED for inviting us to this uh, webinar and thank you to Evelyn uh, for this general context uh, on the situation. I'm trying to share my screen with you. I hope uh, that everybody can see my screen. So I have uh, prepared a very short PowerPoint presentation to present the lessons learned by the civil society with regards to this issue of the living income uh, differential and uh, the lessons that we have learned. Uh, this concept of uh, the LID is uh, something uh, that has begun to be uh, very much present in uh, the civil society sector in Côte d'Ivoire since 2019. Um, there were studies carried out in 2017, 2018 um, with regards to uh, this uh, living income. And uh, there were decisions to try to evaluate uh, the level of income of producers, and in particular, uh, the uh, differences that exist. And uh, this follows on, therefore, to, from uh, the negotiations between uh, Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana to try to um, agree uh, this uh, living income at $400 per tonne. This was something that generated a lot of hope, but also a lot of questions. The main question that was asked was, how exactly can we assure, ensure that there will be an effective implementation of the living income differential? So we saw that there were challenges uh, that needed to be faced. One of the first challenges uh, was in terms of the organization of uh, the civil society. And in particular, uh, this uh, concept of the LID and uh, having a participation in uh, general discussions around this. Uh, so with regards to the civil society organizations, uh, there have uh, been uh, m several meetings, the um, COCO Council and so on that we took part in. And this enabled us to get a clearer idea around the LID. And we um, also talked, uh, we had a, a working group uh, that uh, worked on uh, the living income uh, issue, and uh, we uh, tried to support the different um, produ producing um, organizations uh, to implement the LID. And uh, we needed to first and foremost to get them involved in the discussion to have a good understanding of what this living income concept means. And we also needed to discuss the legitimacy and representation within the discussion context. Uh, there has already been a reference uh, made uh, to uh, the fact uh, that this legitimacy and represent representativeness is not necessarily um, obvious. There are some cooperatives that do take uh, part in discussions. Uh, there are cooperatives at different levels. There are some that are at the very basic level, uh, but the issue around the legitimacy of these organizations for representation is something that we really need to think about because to date, we cannot really say that the producing um, organizations are fully represented in the discussion. We also need uh, to think about the capacity for self-monitoring in terms of the implementation of the LID. Uh, this is um, partly uh, ensuring that the cooperatives, once uh, the decisions have been made, uh, can be implemented. When it comes to civil society, uh, we, I, I believe that um, there really is a, a 
sensitiveness of the civil society organizations around the concept of the living income differential. I think that this concept is not something that is new, but the actions to really support producers to enable them to improve their income and to reach a living income, a decent level of income, is something that really requires the involvement of civil society organizations, at least in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. And so we can see that within the cocoa sector, we really need to be able to involve the producers um, at the different levels. And I think that it is the limitations to these uh, actions that took place in the past, which means that uh, we have a response uh, that really needs to boost uh, the um, achievement of these results that we are all seeking. So that means that the civil society organizations really need to get involved in the actual implementation of the LID. On the ground in Côte d'Ivoire, we can see that there are many actions that have been undertaken to enable the improvement of uh, the income level of producers. There are different activities that are implemented on the ground, which um, mean that we then have an implementation throughout the sector through the cooperative organizations. There are different activities um, for producers uh, in terms of organizing uh, their activities, we obviously need to also improve the agricultural practices to improve their yield. And there are also uh, some uh, agricultural uh, practices to protect the environment and to ensure that uh, the sustainability will be uh, real throughout the sector. And there are also many other approaches that exist. So all this means that the improvement of capacity and there are some, uh, some uh, actions for improvement of uh, the income, but there's also some action to improve uh, the activities in terms of um, of representation, and we need to be able to have a more general view of uh, the stakes within uh, the agricultural context, particularly in uh, the cocoa sector, so that we can reach the stage where we are able uh, to inform the producers on the ground. And this is something that is currently being developed and uh, which uh, we are needing to improve the communication to ensure that producers are truly informed of any changes and developments within the cocoa sector. So this is an action that we are implementing in the context of a specific project uh, that uh, we have organized with, with in Kota. And uh, this uh, focuses on the capacity of civil society organizations and uh, producers organization to, for them to be able to take uh, part in the dialogue. So within this project, we, we have uh, grouped, uh, we have this, we have set up this platform and we try to follow what's happening with this campaign for uh, COCO. And we try and follow what's happening in the COCO sector and we produce notes, proposals and so forth to ensure that the decision makers, uh, we gather the decision makers. So this gives us the possibility to be able to express our point of view. And this platform is truly uh, works in a very inclusive, participative way. And the notes produced reflect truly the position and the life of this cooperative who are members of this, this platform. So as regards the scope we have so that the voice of produce, producers can be better heard. I would say this scope is fairly weak, fairly small. As I said earlier, there is always this questioning, this interrogation on the legitimacy of OPA representatives in the uh, discussion uh, platforms. 
what is the mode of designations, how are they appointed, uh, are the representatives appointed, it's not always a transparent uh, approach, it's not always very clear, people are not always very sure of how legitimate these representatives are. And also, the scope is also small and weak because there's a very low uh, sensitivity as regards the, the uh, peasant power. The, the actual farmers do not realize the power they have to influence the management of the running of their own sector because they were always represented or they always represent themselves as being uh, the, the weakest, the leak wing of the value chain, where in fact they are the first and foremost link without whom this uh, sector would not exist. So there is a whole load of work to do regarding the mentality so that producers can uh, recognize uh, more their own power and agency and ensure they take their, their rightful place in the management of this sector. There's also a very weak communication regarding the dialogue process, ongoing dialogue process regarding, with the, uh, regarding the producers. So there was a dialogue launched between uh, Ivory Coast and the European Union regarding the uh, ability, capacity of the sector. But we note that, that regarding a cacao organization, the re uh, representation wa was poor. So they can't really uh, express their opinion. I was telling you earlier, as regards this, this project we, have run, we are running at the moment, there were several proposals made regarding uh, to ensure that we could have a, there was a, an inclusive participative uh, approach, uh, including the producers. These are some of the proposals made regarding the uh, living income differential. So what came out, the proposal that came out of our, of our discussion platform that we had set up, that we need to have really reliable statistics regarding producers and uh, cocoa farmers in Ivory Coast. This is truly important. It's difficult to project to the future and to set up, to create strategies that are truly, uh, uh, that are a good fit. And when there was uh, a missale, when there was this big campaign to commercialize uh, in 2020, 2021, we actually uh, asked the members of the platform uh, to gather and they analyzed the projects that had been realized with the uh, cacao, cocoa and coffee council uh, chair uh, to, uh, to, to sort of see what the situation was. And therefore, the cocoa sector in Ivory Coast has to take into account the changes that are coming. And that should really integrate and represent the, the commercial system and the role of cooperatives within the uh, purchase of cocoa, but also the supply for uh, producers and uh, chocolate companies. So this really, uh, the situation actually has fragilized, has, has made, a, the, there are a lot of stakeholders, a lot of players uh, in Ivory Coast regarding the uh, industrial and farmers for cocoa. So this role should be devolved to the cooperative, but they are weakened. And this is really a source of weakness for the producers. It was also uh, uh, suggested that we would uh, uh, fix uh, the price that you would have, uh, uh, you would have uh, prices that would be fixed taking into account the production fees, but we advise the council, the Cocoa Council, that they should really set the price that would be a remuneration for the producers, uh, taking into account the cost of production. And what came out, the price of 1,000 francs was well received by the producers, but this price covered, barely covered their cost 
to produce cat cocoa. So therefore we need to, the, so we have, uh, we still need to work towards this uh, living income differential. It, therefore the producers suggested that the warranty fund, the guarantee fund, uh, which exists uh, for the Cocoa Coffee Council, and this should uh, compensate the losses incurred by the producers if there is a missell. It, so we are, were able to activate this warranty fund fi financing and also improve the capacity of internal uh, storage for cocoa production. And also the uh, producers suggested to foster and support transform transformation, the, the uh, actual um, local consumption of cocoa. But the uh, miss sale, in 2020-2021 pushed a certain number of cooperatives to actually work in the transforming industry, transformation industry, and that was in order to improve the revenue of the income of the producers. Now, the lessons, uh, what the takeaways, if you want, is that uh, reaching living income uh, for producers it depends a lot on the uh, goodwill of multinationals but also of procedures to guarantee the transparency of the uh, sector management inclusivity and it was not uh, effective and producers really suffered from that what we have noticed is is that cooperative uh, were uh, in uh, sustainability programs working in in that and they did not truly uh, felt this crisis there was during the 2020-21 campaign but conventional cooperative it was fairly difficult for them so the lid was not we really need to go towards prices that are uh, uh, lucrative. And in Ivory Coast. So we will share the slides after the uh, the event. So you can, uh, and, and there's, there's a one hour discussion session. So we can continue the chat afterwards anyway. So it, it's not lost at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And apologies for interrupting you. Um, Sandra, if you, it, Voilà, c'est parfait. Good morning to everyone. Yeah. So I'm Sandra Sakwa and I work with Send Ghana, um, but also I play a very um, instrumental role in the um, Ghana Civil Society Cocoa platform. So that is a platform that um, you know brings on board different civil society actors, including cocoa farmers, um, civil society organizations, NGOs. Uh, media, but then also trade unions, and we have some individuals in there, um, basically to foster advocacy, um, to influence cocoa sector policies in Ghana. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this webinar and to give my thoughts on um, issues centering around the living income differential. I think um, the earlier um, speakers have, you know, tackled um, on the the basis for the living income differential and um, giving a picture of, 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 of the initiative. So if, if I have the privilege, I would want to just delve into the conversation straight off. Um, I think that we all acknowledge the significance of the, 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 the LID, in short, the living income differential and um, how impactful this policy um, it's anticipated to be on, on um, farmers' livelihood. So we, we also acknowledge as civil society that it is not an all-in-all -all solution to um, farmers' plight or, or to the cocoa sector, um, but then we must admit and also recognize the fact that it is a very key and critical you know, um, policy to help improve farmers' livelihood. Um, in trying to uh, implement this initiative, Ghana and as Côte d'Ivoire, I mean the, the deal, there has been um, some challenges um, surrounding it, but particularly um, with farmers' voices or producer voices. And um, I would want to speak to um, some of the challenges 
that we have observed around um, this uh, uh, in context. Um, we acknowledge that there has been some involvement um, of some farmers in the uh, LID discussions at especially the inceptions emanating from community of practice. So sorry about that. Here I have um, some uh, internet um, challenges, so I, I have myself, uh, my video turned off. So um, yes, we, we, we acknowledge some level of um, participation or, and or involvement of, of um, cocoa farmers in the discussions around the living income differential in the early stages. Um, I remember uh, in somewhere in June, July, 2019, when um, the, 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 the discussions had to take place in Accra and then advancing it also in um, Cote d'Ivoire, um, some farmers confirmed that they participated in, 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 in these discussions. However, the, the question to be asked is who is representing um, farmers and or producers at these levels? Are these uh, representations acknowledged by the larger producer population? And if they are present in these meetings, um, do they represent and or present the minds and demands of the numerous smallholder cocoa farmers? So these are um, questions that I think um, um, we need to reflect on when we talk about um, farmers' voices being heard around implementation of the living income differential and or even the design of the, of the policy. But then also the approach to including producers in the design of the lead has not been comprehensive. So in, in um, some cases, I think that um, farmers have I, I, I confirmed that uh, it was a bottom um, up approach that needed to be you know, um, used and or, or employed um, other than the top down approach. So farmers um, consider themselves as you know, um, um, takers of of price in, in this instance where the calculation you know was done um, somewhere indoors with just some few you know representations coming from farmers and in the end they hear a particular you know figure coming out uh, as, as, as that differential. So um, in, in Saint Ghana for instance um, we conducted a recent uh, study um, which proposed that one of the approaches that should be you know, um, used by our government, and here I'm talking about the regulator or COCO board, um, must find a way of using a, a bottom-up approach in um, sourcing or soliciting for you know, input or views of cocoa farmers um, and, and when it comes to determination of prices, of cocoa and um, farm gate prices, and, and even for other and um, related sector policies. So these are also very critical things that I think um, were over um, seen as far as the um, design of the lead is concerned. But then also, um, you know, one challenge has been that um, farmers have not had that ability to, you know, um, have that common front that would help them, you know, um, 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 have a common voice that when they speak, it, it, it you know, exerts a, a louder voice and, and, and amasses some kind of, you know, that would get um, um, policymakers to make that Im immediate change and then and, and responding to their needs. And so um, there is, you know, that need for um, we to, as civil society, as other um, sector players to supporting cocoa farmers, you know, um, to having that common front or voice. And I think that um, there are some current interventions on, on board. Um, to get to speak to responses from civil society um, regarding the LID, um, over the past few years, civil society, you know, uh, fraternity has made deliberate efforts to contribute to uh, initiatives and all discussions to improving uh, um, and farmers' income. Therefore, the late is of core importance to us. And in Ghana, for instance, there has been the establishment of um, a civil society alliance, and that is linking producer groups to civil society organizations, NGOs, and media, trade uh, unions, and that is the Ghana Civil Society Cocoa Platform that I mentioned earlier and associated myself as a member. Um, and we are undertaking critical advocacy engagement to influencing cocoa sector policies to enhance farmers' livelihood. Um, again, um, 
the alliance, you know, or the platform um, continues to support uh, Ghana and then Cote d'Ivoire government on the late. And we have undertaken, you know, consistently some advocacy interventions and all initiatives um, like um, issuing press statements to supporting the late. Um, individual organizations on the ground are also undertaking very critical and innovative um, um, activities, um, you know, providing information on the living income differential to farmers at the community level um, within farmer cooperatives. And we are collaborating to do quite a number of things to just, you know, get farmers um, well informed on the living income differential. And there's more to be done. Um, we are also, you know, through other forms of advocacy uh, activities, trying to um, demand consistently from um, um, companies to, as it is, uh, redeem their commitment to paying the living income differential, um, owing to the fact that um, the recent um, um, cocoa season has faced a challenge with implementation of the of the differential. Um, we, um, if we look at the 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 the, the scope and all the the um, what is happening currently, um, there are quite a number of um, approaches and or leverages that we can um, tap into as not just producing countries um, or, you know, as farmers, but I think to all, all of us um, as key uh, sector players. And so we, we foresee um, that already, you know, um, um, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire um, as the two producer giants, um, who have taken this initiative as a very, you know, um, 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 significant and bold step, and will, um, however, um, think that um, to go or having a more strategic way of, you know, um, influencing and or pursuing the implementation of the lead, um, there will be the need to also bring on board the other um, producing countries like Cameroon, Nigeria. You know, to make sure that um, 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 we broaden the scope, and for that matter, um, there is a huge voice being amassed to to um, in, um, influence and or push for the sustenance of the living income differential. Um, there is also that um, scope and all that leveraging on the ongoing EU um, trade regulations and the discussions um, to ensure that companies support the living income differential implementation. And personally, for me, I am really looking at seeing the lead, you know, uh, actually uh, um, um, being seen or surfacing somewhere within the regulations such that we, we get companies to, you know, um, really commit to, to supporting the living income differential. So if, if there are all these interventions um, coming from the EU level, um, we producing countries and specifically coming from civil society actors will actually have this call to demand for um, a portion that will speak specifically on the living income differential. Um, what producers, you know, feel needs to be done to ensure that they receive the living income differential. Um, one is to really, you know, get our government, you know, to be transparent and accountable to, 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 to farmers, but then also to the public on how implementation of the lead, you know, is being um, done. And so it even boosts and or give that kind of, you know, backing to the government um, where civil society actors um, with informed, you know, um, and all with um, a lot of information from government can give that um, support where um, companies are failing to support uh, and the implementation of the late. A lot of stakeholders, including civil society actors, can actually back government, you know, in making sure that um, this policy actually um, leaves or is being sustained. And so that um, call to government, producing government, is really one of our priorities. And then also we, uh, civil society, are actually demanding and or calling for um, that in huge investment to supporting farmers, um, um, you know, uh, initiate um, alternative um, livelihoods um, in a, a more, you know, comprehensive way so that 
we don't have quite um, an ad hoc base of um, 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 alternative initiatives that could also, you know, support the living income differential and in a whole, it could increase and or improve the living um, income um, of cocoa farmers and in the end, improving their um, living standards. So some of the, le the lessons um, our civil society is, is that, um, of course, we know how challenging implementation of the LED has been in the, the, the past um, one year, um, one or a half years, if I may put it. Um, farmers must own the living income differential policy. That is one key lesson um, I pick from, from, from this policy. And so where, where we see government, you know, actually leading um, the policy design of formulation and implementation, um, we also see the outside world, and I'm talking about, you know, um, 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 consuming countries, for instance, seeing government dominating and probably it, gives, it, it raises a lot of questions. So where we have producers themselves actually owning and then leading the front, speaking out and demanding, you know, for the implementation consistently um, gives a lot of weight to um, implementing um, the policy. And so there is this um, um, effort from civil society, for instance, to make sure that we support producers or cocoa farmers to have um, 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 uh, mobilize themselves and to have that common voice where they could you know, um, 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 lead the entire um, advocacy or demand for um, 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 how do you put it, a consistent implementation of the living income differential. Linking lessons from the FLEX and VPA um, must also be brought on board um, in the cocoa sector um, where we see um, cocoa governance, you know, um, um, structures being aligned to ensure that um, we have um, communities, we have um, um, cocoa farmers, voices, head, um, in, in policy decision as we witnessed in the forestry um, 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 sector. So transparency from government is also key. Um, I think um, Pauline mentioned that and I wouldn't want to um, echo on that again. And this means that um, our government must employ an inclusive approach that will engender farmer or producer ownership of the living income differential and other sector policies. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sandra, thank you so much and you I was going to ask you to wrap up, which you just did. That's fantastic. Um, Ismaila, I hope you're still, you're still here. And it, yes, you are here. And um, yes, so thank you, Sandra, for your presentation. Ismaila, over to you. Um, good morning, and uh, my uh, regards to all my co-panelists. My name is Pomasi Ismaila. I'm the chairperson of the Kuwa Association which is a farmer-based organization in Ghana uh, with a current membership of over 10,000 members operating in all the cocoa growing regions in the country. Now, what we do as an association, I mean, our main objective is to improve the livelihood of farmers who have subscribed to the, to the package that we give them. And um, as part of our objective, we, we, we have extension offices. Yeah, what I'm saying is that I'm the chairman of Cocoa Abroad Association. Um, it's a farmer-based organization in Ghana with a current membership of over 10,000 operating in all the cocoa growing regions in the country. Our main objective is to improve the livelihood of our cocoa farm members who are part of this association. So we are um, actually giving farmers you know, training uh, on good agricultural practices. We also do certification. We undertake community development projects. And then we also operate in pension scheme, what we call it cocoa proper pension scheme, where members do contribution and then uh, this contribution, we, 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 we think that eventually it will secure the future, you know, uh, income for, for, for cocoa farmers after their retirement. So this is what we do in our association. Now, um, with this particular um, discussion that we are having, um, a virtual discussion on the living income differential, which has come to stay, I have to borrow the words of my tea, living income differential has come to stay. Now, let's all try to look at why this living income differential and why it must come to stay. When we look at all the sustainability challenges that we are facing with, 
talk of child labor, talk of deforestation, and living income. I have consistently maintained that the engine of the industry is pricing. Pricing that would actually guarantee a living income for cocoa farmers. When you are able to deal or solve the problem of living income for cocoa farmers, then all other sustainability challenges can be addressed. We've had a series of discussions on deforestation, on child labor, and all of that. But most of the times, what baffles me is the low level of discussion that we have on, 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 on living income. Anytime living income discussion comes up, the only assurance we give farmers is that farmers should look at alternative livelihood you know, uh, um, programs. What, what this tells us is that we are admitting that the cocoa cannot, with a current price, the cocoa cannot guarantee a farmer a living income. And for that matter, the farmer needs to also undertake other projects that would also you know, uh, 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 bring some level of income to the farmer. And for me, I think that this narrative has always been bad. We cannot ensure sustainability when the very work the farmer does cannot guarantee him a living income. When you look at the value chain, all the players along the value chain, how many of these uh, players have been told to engage in other uh, alternative livelihood to guarantee him a living income, apart from the work that he's doing? It is only the farmer that we have all come to accept that the cocoa and the price of the cocoa cannot guarantee you a living income and for that matter, engage yourself in other alternative livelihood pro pro programs. Many researchers have come to show clearly that especially Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and I think that perhaps one of the reasons why these two countries champion this living income differential discussion is because many of the production of cocoa, the very farmers who are producing cannot assure themselves of a living income then where lies the sustainability? How can we bridge the, the generation gap that we have? How do we ensure that at the moment, farmers who are working in their cocoa farm, when they grow old, their children will take up the work that they are doing. How are we going to attract the youth to go into the sector? When it is so clear that these farmers are not getting a living income, this tells us clearly that there was something urgently needed to be done to be able to at least start solving the problem. And I think that is why these two countries, the leadership of these two countries decided that they have to come out with something that would actually top up the current price for farmers to at least begin to see some level of a living income. We are not saying that we want to live a luxurious life. We want to get income that would actually sustain us to make a living, which I think is a fundamental human right. So if we're doing this work and we are not able to guarantee ourselves a living income, for me, I will once again say that the sustainability, there is a big question mark with the sustainability. But come to look, think about the approach these two countries undertook. Initially, there was some kind of a threat to the industry that if you do not accept this, all other sustainability projects will hurt them. And for me, this living income differential discussion should have started on that note. Because all the industry players, all of us, we agree that we need to make sure farmers improve their, their livelihood. We need to make sure that farmers are getting a guaranteed living income. But these two producing countries, are coming up with a project that will help us address the problem that we are all trying to solve. But we saw some kind of resistance coming from other big players. I don't think that that was, that was, that was a good precedent to start with the discussion of the, on the living income. It has now come to stay. Ghana, we saw some level of increment in our uh, producer price. And this increment was as a result of the living income differential. We welcome it and wish that no future discussion will come to erode the successes this living income differential is talking. Of course, there are some challenges with the implementation of the living income. 
One of the challenges for me that we are unable to assess the situation fairly to know whether it is as a result of the implementation of the living income or the COVID-19 effects that globally we are all experiencing. We are, we are told that global demand for chocolate, you know, cocoa products has gone down and it's really affecting customers to uh, uh, buy more cocoa beans and it's really giving some kind of a problem to Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, cocoa farmers. This year, we had a problem of, at a point we were not even getting paid for the cocoa that we were selling. And one of the reasons that, 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 that we were given was that the, 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 the COVID-19 situation is affecting All right, what I'm saying is that, yes, we accept the discussion on living income. We hope and pray that it will come to stay. But we are also appealing to these two um, countries, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, our leadership to also put in um, structures to ensure, ensure that the living income differential would come to stay. And we have that serious commitment from our, our customers and that we can measure this commitment to actually know whether they are deviating from helping to implement this living income differential or not. And like Sandra said, I mean, this came from um, these two countries that are producing global cocoa. But we also believe that too. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that going forward, we, we wish that Ghana Cote d'Ivoire would also involve other producing countries to also come on board and help champion the cause of this living income differential. The living income differential is not an end to itself. It's a starting point. We believe that going forward, the discussion that we need to hold globally should be what price, normal international price, that would actually secure a living income for cocoa farmers globally and not something called a living income differential. Because if you are not careful, a time will come that this living income differential with the adjectives that it has would also come and fade out. We want something that we can all make sure that it has come to stay. And it is a price, a global price that gives us that living income and not a living income differential 400. They say when it goes, cocoa price is below $2,600 per ton, then we bring in the living income. I am, I am pretty sure that if this is the narrative, then the industry will make sure that the cocoa price at the international level will not go beyond 2,600. And that is what we should avoid. So let us bring all countries on board to have a serious discussion on what price, minimum price will guarantee the farmer a living income and not a living income differential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ismaili, and apologies for the um, connection. That's always um, a risk we're facing. Uh, we, uh, we're very late, uh, but we're moving now to the uh, discussion part of this event. And please feel free to uh, type in questions in the Q&A box. I can see there are already two uh, very interesting questions, one from Catherine, one from Emma. Um, so I will uh, ask the question from Catherine. Um, in both um, either country, um, are there any producer organizations, APEC organizations? And if so, how does civil society support them to ensure this bottom-up participation in decision-making? I don't know who uh, wants to start. I'm sure you all have um, a view about this, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know, Madame Zay, Sandra, Evelyn, or Ismaili, who wants to take this first question? So I'm um, very interested question. Um, if, if you take the case of Ghana, um, there is an already existing, um, you know, supposed farmer, um, you know, umbrella organization or body, um, but the, the issue has got to do with um, its representation and its um, formation. So it's seen as a government-led, you know, um, um, initiative 
or governments leading the formation of this group. And so um, a lot of uh, smallholder farmers down there do not um, you know, acknowledge its, its dealings um, as representing all smallholder cocoa farmers. So that has been the issue. And in the interim, there is this um, other you know, school of thoughts trying to come on board with um, a kind of neutral and farmer-led um, umbrella body. Um, if you've, you've heard of World Cocoa Farmers Organization, we have a Ghana chapter. And so that is one of such bodies that we probably, if um, they are having um, some support from all of us, um, they might be in the position to you know, um, represent that apex farmer um, 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 organization that Catherine is asking for. So in the interim, um, this is the two um, cases I have presented to you um, on the Ghana um, side. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Madame Zay, for la Côte d'Ivoire. Well, with regards to Côte d'Ivoire, uh, I think that there is a uh, group of exporters, the GPEX, which is uh, the export uh, group. I think this was something that was explained uh, in the uh, debate around uh, the cocoa sector, but I think that it is a bit of an intermediary between the multinationals and the producers. So the civil society organizations are focused more on the producers organizations, which are the ones that most need the support in order to truly take part in the dialogue. This, this is what we are trying to do and what I was explaining earlier in the context of our project, we've already um, developed a platform through which we are trying to uh, include as many cooperative organizations as possible so that they are first and foremost informed, but also that they are represented and we can try to translate their ideas into proposals. So this is a process to become much more inclusive. And uh, this is a bottom up approach uh, that we are trying to implement uh, the processes being developed. So there are a lot of uh, uh, agencies, if you want, organizations that are not always included within the process. So what we are doing is we are actually uh, proposing uh, the fact that this organization can be part of the dialogue because we feel that this will be through them, through these channels, if you want, that the uh, cocoa farmers and producers will be able to get their point of view heard and also express themselves. Okay, very good. Um, I think on my case, I can speak about myself. Um, I've been the chairman of the association, I've had or the association, the leadership of the association has had some collaboration with um, Pen Ghana, which is also um, a civil society organization. Of course, I'm also a member of uh, Ghana Proposed Civil Society Platform, where um, we've had series of training. I believe just about a month ago, we had training on the calculation of this living income differential. Uh, we had about two, three days training that actually you know, took us through what went into the calculation of the living income differential, which helped us equip ourselves with the knowledge of on, on how this living income, you know, came about. And and I've also had some engagement with Coco Board on most of their discussions uh, on other sustainability projects. We do recognize the fact that, you know, cooperative is the way to go. Just about two years ago, Coco Board also realized that uh, there is a need to um, assist farmers to form cooperatives. So they launched national, nationwide, you know, um, cooperatives uh, where they encourage farmers to join cooperatives to be able to deal directly and also to access information from Cocoa Board. Currently, we have an umbrella organization, uh, which is Cocoa Sheet, 
focus is, 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 is cocoa farmers and say, say um, not farmers association, yes. But like Sandra said, the process of appointing who represents us at that level has not been that transparent. And I'm sure it's one of the reasons why Cocoa Board itself realized they need to help come to the grassroots and then encourage farmers to form, you know, associations so that they can have that better engagement with, with, with farmers going forward. So, yes, we have had some level of, if there's, you know, a, 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 a cooperative discussion that has not been that transparent for us. Thank you, Ismaila. Would Evelyn want to add anything else? Yeah, I, I realize or well, I observe that we have like a lot of discussions, like who is the real representative of farmers. And I, I find this discussion a little bit difficult because even if we look into European countries, obviously there are umbrella organizations of farmers, but usually in each of the countries, at least also for Germany, we have two or three different umbrella organizations. So to think there will be one single unique national cocoa farmers organization, I, I think we should take a step back from that. I think what's important is that cooperatives are professionalized, are well equipped with information, that they are able to understand the whole global supply chain and um, becoming more and more and having more and more the capacity to to become involved in decision making processes and that obviously starts already with like having a democracy in their own cooperative to have like elections of leaders in their cooperative and then we might have like you know a bunch of um, umbrella organizations, but not this only one single Ghanaian cocoa farmers organization or Ivorian cocoa farmers organization. You know, I, I think we also have to see that the, the majority of cocoa farmers are not even organized yet in a structured way. So there's still a way to go. And I think like the the um the need of other stakeholders we want to talk with one organization um is also a little bit because it's easier for us if we have like one organization to talk with and think okay they represent all cocoa farmers but there's a diversity of cocoa farmers so that's not going to be the easy way forward and i think we as stakeholders have to deal with that um yeah but i think there are also other important questions in the, in the Q&A. Maybe we have time to also address those. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, another question, and I've, I've seen it's been upvoted four times, so I'm going to read it both in um, in English and I will translate into French for uh, Madame Zay. Uh, so both Ghana and Ivory Coast governments have a stake in decisions on the LID. Can we see from the presentations that CSOs matter in this discussion if you want to make progress? The challenge is both governments um, have not been welcoming or open in, in allowing CSO participation, CSO in, in these discussions. What approach are we talking, uh, uh, are we taking to make the governments to see CSOs as allies in pushing this agenda leading to their involvement in this issue. And now, je vais traduire en français rapidement. Uh, les gouvernements du Ghana et uh, Madame Zé, vous avez vous avez vu la traduction ou, ou uh, vous voulez que je traduise pour vous? Well, moi, je vais... Yes. So, I think that there is always there's always been a collaboration between all stakeholders for the cocoa sector whether it be to for the for to reform the sector or for a certain amount of decision taking decision making but when we talk about some critical points in particular how to fix the uh, price and the ongoing discussion in ghana for instance about this or management manage the management of uh, uh, commercialization, the commercialization campaign, trade campaign, there are also always, there, there is a certain weakness and some limitation because 
there's a lack of transparency at some level, at certain levels. So as regards Ivory Coast, how do we collaborate with the uh, decision makers and with multinationals? I will give you a few examples. I would say that with multinationals, uh, this is more a case of uh, program development projects, for instance, that are set up and then uh, carried out uh, in favor of the cooperative. So these projects, for instance, are funded by multinationals and, and implemented by the civil society organization with the support of the government. And the government also sometimes through civil so civil society organization sets up programs interaction uh, uh, projects with the uh, cocoa farmers so this reinforces the ca the capacity that cocoa farmers and producers have and cooperative have in the field as regards the uh, ad advocacy and uh, participating to the decision making process we also there is also a participation of different uh, osc which are implemented either through governments or through other technical uh, agencies or development agencies and but regarding uh, advocacy i would say often we have to uh, fight to ensure that we can take part within those spaces, these platforms, and we really must be able to knock at the right door and have a dialogue with the right people to be included. So I would, we, we truly try to create this link between gov the government, multinationals, and civil society organizations so that we, the, uh, the true beneficiaries are the, the cocoa farmers so that they can be better supported and that what their worries are taken into account. But indeed, we always find that there are uh, uh, challenges on the horizons, always difficulties to implement things to ensure that uh, this uh, system because institutional so this collaboration is becomes institutionalized and ensures that it tackles issues in a satisfactory manner yes yeah um what i want to add to what um the other speaker said is that yes civil society or you know their work should be seen as uh, a way of also um helping uh, Cocoa Board here. I'm in Ghana, so I make reference to Cocoa Board uh, to also appreciate the fact that they are also playing an important role in their area of work. It is not all the time that civil society organizations criticizes, you know, or criticize government. Sometimes well, they also, you know, uh, do a constructive criticism, which uh, um, 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 government must also accept. This issue of living income differential, I can tell you that most of the explanation that farmers got from the living income differential came from civil society organizations. They organized series of workshops, took farmers through and helped farmers understand all the elements that went into the, uh, how do you call it, uh, the living income differential. They are doing a lot of work, but sometimes uh, the government also think that these, these, these organizations are just in to criticize. The work cannot be done by government alone. We all have to come on board to help solve the sustainability issues that confront us as, 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 as you know, cocoa producers. Many civil society organizations have organized series of training to build capacity of, you know, pharma cooperatives, the leadership of pharma cooperatives. To be able to understand the issues that you know uh, uh, go on with the value chain, many of these discussions have been championed by civil society organizations. I would want to look forward to see a situation where government would would, would open their doors freely in a transparent manner to allow civil society organizations to also augment uh, the work that they are doing, because many of them are really helping farmers. Thank you. 
can I just add on to absolutely yes. yes so quickly um yeah so um great I I think that um in in Ghana um we as civil society have actually you know registered and or um, affirmed our position on the living income differential and how um, we support um, this policy intervention um I think that done consistently in itself puts us in a position where um, already government, and here I'm referring to Cocoa Board, you know, um, recognizes that support um, that, okay, surely um, CSOs are supporting and or back the, the, the initiative. Um, what we can do, um, trying to, you know, respond directly to this question, um, most of us um, undertake, you know, um, evidence-based um, approach to advocate, um, advocacy. And so, um, you know, receiving some of these feedback emanating from um, that um, at Saint Ghana, and that it has, you know, um, resulted to um, 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 uh, some responsiveness from, from Cocoa Board, we may want to employ that mechanism by, you know, researching or looking more into the implementation of the living income differential as we progress with implementation. And we, you know, um, mobilize and or put these um, findings um, from this um, 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 research work before Cocoa Board and then, you know, dialogue with them. I think that the, 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 the key word is to dialogue and or discuss with them, you know, in a very strategic manner, meaning the people who really matter must be around the table. Um, not necessarily, you know, coming out into the media space, but then we, we we try and engage them on what we have seen with issues to, you know, transparency and all participation or involvement of farmers and civil society and, and so forth. And I think they they are going to open up their, their doors and receive some of this feedback to, you know, um, 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 shaping the, the policy implementation. I would also like to add something here, um, and I would like to bring it back to my um, input in the beginning. I think we have to look a little bit back where we're coming from. And in Coco, um, in Ivory Coast and in Ghana, um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when the debate on sustainable cocoa production was already highly discussed in Europe and in the US, um, civil society groups in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire were not involved at all. And I think we have moved already a great step forward um, that at more and more conferences and um, a good example are the latest developments um, organized by the European Commission with high level um, consultations of all stakeholders and um, civil society organizations are becoming involved. They are asked for their opinion. They are asked for giving a position paper um, to be part of the discussion. Still, I think there's a long way still to go because many stakeholders, if they organize a conference, if they organize consultations, it's not the first thing they think about, OK, can we consult producers or CSOs from Ghana, from Cote d'Ivoire? And that's where I think also is a task for European NGOs like in Quota to raise awareness on that, to continuously supporting CSOs and producer organizations to open those doors, Pauline has talked about, to knock on those doors and tell them, if you talk about Coco, you should not talk about Coco if you don't involve local CSOs and the cocoa producing organizations. And I think in both countries, um, we have seen a development where there are platforms or working groups where a lot of NGOs came together. I think in Ghana, it's about 15 and, you know, I think five or six of the big pr producer organizations. In Cote d'Ivoire, it's about 20 organizations and CSOs. Um, where they come together to, to form a common position and a common strategy on how to influence the cocoa policies. And 
this has not existed like five years ago. So I think that's a start. And as more as everybody is raising the awareness that there is civil society and there are producer organizations who really have an opinion on what is happening, the better it is. And I think they have to be loud. I mean, if you don't, if you're not loud, you're not seen. Um, yeah, so that's basically my, my final statement here. Thank you so much, Evelina. And we do need to, to wrap up. Um, I will, however, um, read the comments from um, a couple of comments in the chat box. Um, an important uh, la question des multinationales. Il faut corriger la symétrie de l'information. A com comment from Debra. Sorry, I'm switching to English now. I think the CSOs are very important in developing farmer lives. Looking at my cooperatives, there have been a lot of development and improvement in farmer lives from community development to alternative livelihood, which has helped farmers to get additional income source. And uh, it's a very helpful comment from Deborah from um, Asuna for Cooperative. Thank you so much. We are running out of time, unfortunately, and I know we could spend another uh, two hours, even two days on this topic, but uh, my colleague Emily from IED is going to very quickly wrap up. Hi again, and uh, this is really just to say a big thank you. I can't possibly give justice to the, to the presentations and discussions, um, but what we will do is try and capture a lot of this in uh, a blog um, uh, and share that with everybody. Uh, as Thierry said, the conversation could go on um, a lot longer. Uh, but I think what this has done is, uh, and, and a lot of the presenters alluded this, uh, to this at the start, is actually at this level, international dialogue, uh, we're not hearing uh, farmers and, and cooperatives' voices, um, and that's happening at all levels, but that is also changing. Um, so that this kind of discussion, that raising this agency in the sector, voices within the sector um, is key in its own right, um, let alone tackling the, the decision, the, the issues at hand. So I think broadly what we've heard, um, and it's very raised this very clearly, was that this is of course welcome, this development on the LID, um, and we've heard that it's facing many challenges um, at many, many levels. Um, but that it needs to be recognized as the starting point and a starting point to establish pricing as one of the key issues. Um, and it's caught up in uh, power within the value chain uh, and it's caught up in uh, where there's been distraction towards other issues. Um, uh, and the feeling is that with pricing, other sustainability issues can flow from there. So we absolutely have to pick this up and, and build on it and run with it. And a lot of what we heard today is the work that people are doing on um, building uh, information, uh, an information base at the farmer level, building um, organization at the farmer level, building legitimate representation um, at the level of cocoa farmers so that that power is, the power that set is there, is recognized and can be voiced um, and can be heard. So we move from how it can be built up to how it can be heard by governments. And, and whilst there is a long way to go, this has triggered a lot of action but also we need to recognize um, the progress that has been made to date. And that certainly is sounding very strong, um, but uh, we know that there are continued um, and persistent challenges in actually making shifts in the way um, the markets are structured and, and the power dynamics within them. So there's been a big effort on making um, organizations more inclusive and more representative. Um, and that work is, is due to continue. And all the panelists today have been very generous in their sharing of reflections on both the, the challenges they're facing, the successes in the work they're doing um, and the work that is still to be done. And I think everyone recognizes the, the confusion in the last year, particularly about what some of the causes of the challenges in the, the LID implementation are, uh, because we've had changes in, in cocoa demand um, affecting the price. Um, so there's a lot of uh, aspects that will play out in time over the next year as well. Um, but it's certainly been a fascinating uh, discussion from, from our point of view. Um, and one that we very, look, very much look forward to continuing um, and, and to continue this focus on, on agency. How can 
farmers who uh, may feel caught in a, in a particular value chain, uh, recognize their own power um, and be supported to, to take action according to their own priorities as individual farmers or collectively. Um, so apologize, apologies again for perhaps not enough time to, to discuss as much as we'd want to um, and for technical issues which have made some aspect challenging to hear, but we'll certainly try and iron those out in the capturing of the event. Um, and uh, we've shared some links in the chat, but please do get in touch if you would like to hear um, more uh, about the Empowering Producers in Commercial Agriculture project. Um, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue in other forms. So uh, thank you very much to all the speakers and to the interpreters. Uh, and I'll hand back over to Thierry to say any further closing words or thanks that I've forgotten. <laughs> yes, th thank you, Emily. Thank you to all the panelists and interpreters, participants. I'm going to close now just to say that we're going to uh, write a very a, a blog that will summarize these discussions, including uh, a link on recording of the presentations, uh, uh, the slides from Madame Zay. And um, I will also be sending very shortly a, a very quick survey for, um, you know, so you can tell us how what, what you thought about this event and, uh, you know, the things we did well or not so well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and um, look forward to the, to the next event.